So this is the uh, third part about relaxation. And uh, I hope you noticed that almost all of the time for the uh, previous two sections, I've been talking about longitudinal relaxation. That's the process which takes the Z magnetization to its equilibrium value. And so all the stuff we talked about was principally about that. And we also talked as well about uh, the nuclear overhauser effect. And again, that's to do with Z magnetization. So this section is exclusively concerned with transverse relaxation. Uh, now, transverse relaxation is the decay of the X and Y components of magnetization back to, to their equilibrium values, which is zero. So the X and Y components uh, decay towards zero. And of course, it's this which determines the decay of the free induction decay uh, and ultimately the line width in the spectrum. Now, you'll recall, I hope, that we said that transverse local fields, and transverse means in the xy plane, so transverse local fields oscillating near to the Larmor frequency cause longitudinal relaxation. And we got from that that the longitudinal relaxation rate depended on the spectral density at the Larmor frequency. Now, such fields can also affect the X and Y components of the magnetization, uh, of the individual magnetic moments, sorry, and therefore also cause transverse relaxation. Now let's have a little think about that. Imagine we've got the magnetic moment for an individual spin here. Uh, it's like this. We have an oscillating transverse field at the right frequency, and it rotates the uh, magnetic moment towards Z you can see that that automatically means that the X, and X or Y component has to decrease. Right? Because the thing has got a fixed length, if you rotate it towards Z, then by definition, the X and Y components are going to decrease as well. So the first thing is that everything which causes longitudinal relaxation will also cause transverse relaxation. The two things are absolutely connected. And this is called the non-secular contribution to transverse relaxation. And there's another contribution which we'll come to in a moment. So the first thing is that everything that causes longitudinal relaxation also necessarily causes transverse relaxation. And that is the non-secular contribution. But there's another contribution which has quite a different origin. Remember that we've got our little uh, uh, magnetic moment here from each individual spin. And this is going round and round the magnetic field at the Larmor frequency. But our local field may have a component along the Z direction. And therefore it will change the field experienced by the spin. And just for that spin, it will change the Larmor frequency. So this individual magnetic moment may be going around at one frequency, but this one may be going around at a very slightly different frequency because it's experiencing a slightly different field along the Z direction. So the, these local fields will cause a spread of Larmor frequencies, and if all the individual spins are going around at different frequencies, slightly different frequencies, they'll get out of step with one another, and that will cause the net X and Y magnetization to shrink over time. Right? So it's this picture you should have in your mind, is that things are going around all at slightly different frequencies, so eventually they get out of step with one another, and that's the decay of the transverse magnetization. And this is called the secular contribution to transverse relaxation. So there are two contributions. There's the non-secular contribution, which is caused by transverse local fields oscillating near the Larmor frequency. And then there's the secular contribution, which is caused by the Z component uh, of the local field, <coughs> resulting in a spread uh, of uh, different Larmor frequencies. And we have to keep these two contributions in mind. 
So the non-secular contribution, basically the description of that is exactly the same as for longitudinal relaxation and crucially we'll de discover that its rate depends on the spectral density at the Larmor frequency. Now what we will discover is that the secular contribution, this is the contribution due to this spread of Larmor frequencies, it turns out that the rate of this process depends on the spectral density at zero frequency. And that's the key distinguishing feature of the secular contribution. And what we're going to do is explore a bit about why that is. Why does the secular contribution depend on the spectral density at zero frequency? And a good way of exploring this is to think about chemical exchange uh, because that turns out to be a useful analogy for the secular contribution. And so that's what I'm going to do. So a, a typical kind of chemical exchange problem that you might come across in an elementary account of NMR would be something like this, a cyclohexane. Uh, I've put a fluorine on it. And as you know, the fluorine could be axial or equatorial. Uh, and these two fluorine environments will have different chemical shifts and they'll therefore give rise to different peaks, uh, two different peaks in the spectrum. And there are two limiting cases that you would distinguish. If the rate constant for exchange between these two conformers is much less than the frequency difference between the two lines, we would call that slow exchange and you would see two clear lines in the spectrum. <coughs> So the key thing is if the exchange rate is slow compared to the frequency difference between axial and equatorial, you see two lines in the spectrum, and we call that slow exchange. On the other hand, if the rate constant for exchange is fast compared to the frequency difference between axial and equatorial, then the two lines collapse into one, and you just see a single line at an average position, and that's called the fast exchange limit. And I'm hoping that you're familiar with this idea from elementary accounts of NMR. So here's a diagram just illustrating this. Uh, I've made the shift difference 100 hertz between my two resonances A and B, and if the exchange rate is zero, then you see uh, two distinct peaks. And then as you go up the diagram, the exchange rate goes on increasing. And as you know, what happens to start with is that the two lines broaden. And then they start to merge. And eventually they coalesce at a particular point. And if you carry on increasing the exchange rate, the merged line starts to narrow. And it gets narrower and narrower. And this very, the narrowest line you get with very high exchange rates, that line is said to be exchange narrowed. So at low exchange rates, you have two narrow lines. You go through this intermediate region of broadening and coalescence. And then as you come out the other side, you eventually get back to a single narrow line. And that process of going from a broad single line to a single narrow line is called exchange narrowing. Right? It's the process by which the exchange process is actually causing the line to become narrower. Now that's a description of what you would see in the spectrum. Now it's interesting to think about what's going on here from the point of view of individual spins. Right? This is just what you see from a collection of a large number of spins. We now want to think about what an individual spin might be doing. So each individual spin is either going to be in our environment A or B. Um, it's either going to be axial or equatorial. And it's, a, uh, uh, it's a just a random process. It jumps from environment A to environment B. So one minute the fluorine will find itself axial, and then click, it'll be equatorial. There'll be some random time, then click, it'll be axial again. So it'll be jumping backwards and forwards between axial and equatorial. And the f larger the rate constant, the more rapid the jumps will be. So if the rate constant is small, 
it's going backwards and forwards kind of slowly, and the faster the rate constant, the more quickly each individual spin is jumping between these two environments. So using that model, you can uh, come up with a picture of what individual spins are doing. So look here on the left, uh, the top line shows spin 1, and it starts out at the high frequency, it's going like this, oscillating quite quickly, then it jumps to the low frequency, and then it stays there. Spin 2, on the other hand, started out on the low frequency, and then quickly jumped to the high frequency. Spin 3 did some high, then some low, then some high, and a bit of low, and then some high. All the jumps are just taking place at random times. And likewise for spin 4. So an individual spin is either in one environment or the other. Now what we see in the spectrum is the sum of a very large number of spins, not 4, more like 10 to the 14. And so what I've done is done a simulation where I've added up a very large number of these, and that sh gives you what I've labelled there as FID. So that's the free induction decay. And if you Fourier transform that, you get two lines. So this is actually the slow exchange limit. Each spin is spending some time at the high and some time at the low frequency, but it's spending a significant amount of time at each frequency. Now I redo the calculation... And this time I've upped the uh, rate of jumping between the two environments. So if you look at spin 1, it's, doing a, it's going about a few cycles, then it's changing, it's doing a half a cycle, then it's doing three cycles, then it does another half, and it looks all very jagged because it keeps jumping backwards and forwards between the two environments. And likewise with 2 and 3 and 4. And if you add all of those up, well, they don't actually tend to add up very well. They tend to cancel one another out. The free induction decay rapidly goes to zero, and that corresponds to this very broad line that you get in the intermediate exchange. And if I go to the other limit of making it jump very, very quickly between the two environments, you get what's shown uh, in C. Now, if you look at those sine waves, they are a little bit jagged because it does keep jumping backwards and forwards between the two environments. But it's doing it so quickly that rather than completing several cycles, as it is in A, it's only doing a fraction of a cycle, then it's jumping and doing another little bit, then it's jumping and doing another little bit. So you end up with these rather jagged-looking things. But they are more or less a single frequency, and when you add them up, you get a nice free induction decay that transforms to a single point, a single peak. So this is a way of visualizing what happens in the slow, the intermediate, and the fast region by thinking about the behavior of individual spins, jumping slowly between environments, more quickly, and then very quickly indeed. So, Carrying on with this picture, we can develop an idea about what the condition for fast and slow exchange is. Now, you know what it is, I told you a little while ago, but let's see whether we can work out what it is using this picture. So, what I plot here um, is two cosine waves, uh, the black one and the blue one. Uh, one is at 10 hertz, and one is at 10.5 hertz. So the difference between them is just 0.5 hertz. And in graph A, I've plotted them for 0.1 seconds. And in graph B, I've plotted them for one second. And the point I'm trying to get you to see is that if you looked at graph A, and I said, are those two waves at a different frequency? You'd look at that and you'd say, well... Probably not, actually. They really look very, very similar, especially if you squint a bit. If you look at graph B, and I say, are those waves at different frequency, it's absolutely obvious that they are, because after a few cycles, you can see that the minimum and the maxima start to get out of step with one another. So the point I'm making is, if you've got two waves and you want to tell whether they're at different frequencies... You have to observe them for a time which is long compared to 1 over the frequency difference. Right? 1 over the frequency difference, 
uh, is two seconds. So I've got to observe it for some time comparable with that, say one second, I can see the difference. If I observe it for a time that's very short compared to that, I can't see the difference. Right, so to tell the difference between two frequencies, you've got to observe it for a time which is large compared to one over the difference of the frequencies. So one way of um, describing this would be to do it in terms of a phase difference. So if the difference frequency is delta and we observe for a time tau, then the phase difference between the two waves is 2 pi delta times tau. That's the angle to which they get out of step with one another. So obviously the larger tau is and the larger delta uh, the greater this phase error, this phase difference between the two frequencies. So, for example, the top one, the phase difference is very small indeed. And this is a useful way of thinking about this problem. So, let's imagine we now go back to our exchanging system and we can describe the chemical exchange as having a lifetime, tau x. So, tau x is the average time that it spends on one before it hops to the other. And of course it's just the reciprocal of the rate constant. So if we're going to work out what the frequency is, we need to be able to work that out over a time of about tau x. Because if we wait longer than that, it's going to hop anyway. So to tell the difference between the two frequencies, we've got to be able to see that in a time of the order of tau x. In other words, this phase difference, which is 2 pi delta times the exchange time, uh, has to be significant. So, in order for this phase difference to be significant, uh, tau x has to be uh, much greater than 1 over delta. And uh, that condition, bearing in mind that the uh, tau x is 1 over the rate constant, means that kx, the exchange rate constant, has to be much less than delta. And that's exactly what you know the slow exchange condition is. The rate constant for exchange has to be much less than the frequency difference. And if you turn it the other way around, the frequencies are indistinguishable if the uh, phase is very small, and that means tau x is much less than 1 over delta, and that means the condition for fast exchange is Kx is much greater than the shift difference. The key point here is that what we're talking about is not measuring the frequencies of the two lines. What we're talking about is can we tell the difference between the frequencies of the two lines. And if it's hopping backwards and forwards fast compared to the frequency difference, you can't. And that's when you see a single line. And if it's hopping backwards and forwards slowly compared to the frequency difference, you can, and then you'll see two lines. So that's chemical exchange, two-site exchange. Now, how does this all relate to the uh, secular contribution to transverse relaxation? So let me remind you what that is. We've got all these spins in the sample, and they all experience the applied magnetic field along Z, but they also all experience different local fields along Z due to nearby spins. So the spins have a spread of Larmor frequencies uh, due to the effect of these local fields. So the sort of thing that you might see is something like shown in A here. Instead of there being a single line, I've shown a whole range of different Larmor frequencies. I just cut it off to make a, a, a rectangular distribution. So A is the sort of spectrum that you might expect to see from a sample of spins with a distribution of Larmor frequencies due to the local fields. And you'll have noticed that it doesn't look anything like an NMR line, because NMR lines don't look like that. The thing is, though, these local fields are not static. So remember that all the time the molecules are moving, and that means the local field keeps changing. 
So the local field along Z is one value one minute, and another value the next minute, and another value the next minute, and so on and so on. So this spread of frequencies is present at any one moment, but due to molecular motion, the local fields keep changing and the molecules keep jumping around within this spread of frequencies. Sounds familiar? Just the same thing as chemical exchange. And exactly the same thing will happen in, as happens in chemical exchange. If they start jumping around, this distribution starts to narrow. And then if they jump around faster and faster, it narrows, it narrows. And in the limit, you get a nice sharp line there. And the faster they jump around, the narrower that line becomes. So the square profile on the left is what you would get if there's no motion, just a fixed distribution of, of uh, local fields. But as the local fields start to change, which they will do due to molecular motion, uh, you end up with, uh, first of all, uh, a narrowing, and then eventually this um, exchange narrowing at E. Now, if you look at the numbers, uh, you'll find that uh, you're always well over on the side uh, illustrated by E. So let's have a look at how that works. So if you look uh, in a book about two-site exchange, in the extreme narrow, in the, in the fast exchange limit, when it's collapsed to one line, you can find there that the line width depends on the frequency separation squared divided by twice the exchange rate. Uh, and so that means that the faster the exchange, the narrower the line. That's, that's exchange narrowing. Now, we're not talking about chemical exchange between two sites. We're talking about this molecular motion. What's the time scale of this molecular motion? Well, it's the correlation time. That's how we described it. So we could replace that exchange rate constant very roughly, and this is a very rough calculation, by 1 over the correlation time. Because right? the correlation time is a kind of characterization of the motion. Now this separation in the two site exchange between the two sites, I'm going to replace that by the width of the distribution due to the uh, local fields. I'm going to call that W. So very approximately, and this is a very rough calculation, I would end up with the, the width of the narrowed line due to my local fields is W squared times tor C. And in fact, you then need to remember, and you can put in some numbers, so a typical range of dipolar fields for proton might be about 100 kilohertz, and tor C might be about 100 picoseconds, and if you put those numbers in there, that will give you a, a narrowed line width of 1 hertz. So the point to make is that you really are a long, 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 long way down the exchange narrowing. You know, the original line was 100 kilohertz wide, but the correlation time gives such fast motion that the line is 1 hertz wide. So it's really in the extreme exchange narrowing. Now, you may remember that the spectral density at zero frequency is 2 tor C. Uh, we had that from our introduction of the spectral density. So I can write the width of the narrowed line uh, as a half W squared uh, times J0. And therefore, this is a demonstration of the fact that this secular contribution to transverse relaxation depends on the spectral density at, at zero frequency. And that's basically because it just depends on the correlation time um, because of this exchange narrowing. Right? So that's the secular contribution to transverse relaxation. It's basically analogous to exchange narrowing. And the faster the exchange, the smaller tau c, the narrower the line. So let's summarize what we've got. Transverse relaxation has got two contributions. The non-secular contribution, this is exactly the same as what causes longitudinal relaxation. 
and it's due to transverse fields oscillating near to the Larmor frequency. So that's exactly the same as longitudinal relaxation. Then we've got the secular contribution, and this is due to a distribution of fields along the Z direction, and that this is modulated by molecular motion, which gives you a line width, which is very, very much smaller than the original spread of frequencies. And the non-secular part depends on the spectral density at the Larmor frequency, whereas the secular part depends on the spectral density at zero frequency. And that's the kind of take-home message about transverse relaxation. It has these two components. Now, a nice way of illustrating this is to take a very simple example. It's actually simpler than dipolar relaxation. And just assume that the spin is being relaxed by some randomly varying local field. But we don't ask where the field comes from. We just say, oh, there is a random field. So I'll assume that there's a random field that's got a mean square value, B log squared. And if you plug that into the theory, you can work out that the longitudinal relaxation rate constant is gamma squared and then this mean square field times j at omega naught. That's exactly what you would expect. It depends on the spectral density um, at the Larmor frequency. And if you work out the transverse relaxation rate constant, you find it has two terms one of which depends on J0, and one of which depends on J at omega naught. Well, that's not a surprise. The first term is the secular term that we've been talking about, and the second term is the non-secular term that we've also been talking about. So they are the, first two, they are the two terms um, in the transverse relaxation rate constant. And in fact, if you compare these, you'll see that the non-secular contribution is equal to exactly half the secular contribution, uh, half of the longitudinal relaxation rate constant. So that term in red is a half RZ. And that's a quite an interesting feature, and um, you might want, to, might want to think about why it's a half. Right? So that component, the non-secular one, is half of the, trans of the longitudinal reaction rate constant. Now let's pursue this a bit more, and we'll look at it in the two motional regimes. Remember, we characterized uh, a fast motion region, and that's where the spectral density becomes frequency independent, and is always 2 tor c. And if you work out Rz, the longitudinal rate constant, uh, it becomes that. And if you work out the transverse rate constant, uh, lo and behold, it turns out to be exactly the same thing. So in the fast motion limit, the transverse and longitudinal rate constants are exactly the same. If you then do the same calculation in the slow motion limit, uh, J0 is 2 tor C, and J at omega naught is 2 over omega naught squared tor C. And if you plug that in, you find that the longitudinal rate constant is given by that expression there. And the key thing you see there is that the rate constant decreases as the correlation time increases. And in fact, that's uh, exactly what we saw earlier on. If the correlation time is too long, uh, then the relaxation rate constant goes down. If you look at the transverse uh, term, the J0 term is completely dominant. You can ignore the J at omega 0 term, and you end up with a transverse relaxation rate constant and here, as shown in red, it's proportional to tau c. So the longer you make the correlation time, the faster the transverse relaxation goes. So that gives rise to this kind of graph, which you may have seen before. There is the, trans uh, the longitudinal relaxation rate constant Rz. It starts out increasing. It goes to a maximum 
when the correlation time is 1 over the Larmor frequency, which we discussed before. And then as the correlation time gets longer, the longitudinal relaxation time decreases. However, the transverse relaxation time, it starts out exactly the same as the longitudinal, but once the correlation time increases beyond a certain point, it just goes on and on and on increasing. And the larger tau c, the faster the transverse relaxation. So this is the killer for large molecules. They have rather slow longitudinal relaxation, and they relax very quickly transversely. So you get very broad lines, and that's the problem with large molecules. So it's quite interesting this, that it's the same at, uh, in, the, in the fast motion limit, and then it diverges rapidly when you get to the um, uh, slow motion limit. Now I want to look at what happens if you have two spins with, which are relaxing one another by the dipolar interaction. And this is what we discussed when we were starting talking about uh, the uh, NOE. Now, if you do the same thing for, two, uh, for transverse magnetization, you come up with these two differential equations. And that just says that the uh, X magnetization of spin 1 decays. And that one says uh, that the uh, X magnetization of spin 2 decays. And the rate constants for these two things uh, are given by these rather complicated expressions. But again, you can see that they come in two parts. There's a secular part, and then there's a non-secular part. Now, the secular part is a little bit different this time. It's got a term that depends on J0, which we would expect. And then there's a term that depends on J of the Larmor frequency of the other spin. And this is a little bit unusual. And all of the other ones depend on the, involve the Larmor frequency of the first spin. And they're the non-secular terms. And the interpretation of this term in red is that the local field experienced by spin 1 depends on the spin state of spin 2. Whether it's in the alpha or beta spin state, that will change the local field at spin 1. And the rate at which this spin changes between alpha and beta is the transverse, rela it's, sorry, it's the longitudinal relaxation rate of spin 2. And that will depend on J at the Larmor frequency of spin 2. So turning over this spin causes a change in the local field here, which is classified as a secular contribution. The non-secular contribution is, again, equal to half of the transverse uh, uh, term. Now, the thing that's a bit strange here is if you compare the equations that we have for the Z-magnetization, and here they are, the Solomon equations with the R term and the cross-relaxation term, and then you look at the ones for X-magnetization, you'll notice that there's something missing. And that is, there is no cross-relaxation term between I1x and I2x. Right? There's no term that says sigma times I2x here, or sigma times uh, I2, I1x here. So why is that? The reason is that such a term exists in principle, but actually has no effect that's discernible. And the reason that that's the case is you have to bear in mind that spin 1 and spin 2 are processing at different frequencies. So if you've got I1x, it's going around in the xy plane like this. And then if you've got I2x, that might be going a lot slower. And if you transfer magnetization from one spin to another, from I1x to I2x, then there is this uh, transfer through a thing that's analogous to cross-relaxation, but the magnetization which starts out on, say, spin 1, will suddenly become a little bit of spin 2 magnetization, but spin 2 is over here. Right? And then a little while later, the same thing might happen, and you might get a little more spin 2 magnetization. Now spin 2 is over here somewhere. 
so that there's no net transfer from spin 1 to spin 2 because although there, there may be individual little bits of transfer, they're always basically with a random phase because the two uh, magnetizations are, are processing at different frequencies. And that's why the net result is that there's no transfer. It's because uh, the two spins have different processional frequencies. Now, if you wanted to actually visualize this process, you can do it. And you can do it by artificially making the processional frequencies of spin 1 and spin 2 the same. And you can do that by using this spin locking experiment. So what you do in spin locking is we stay, start out with a 90Y. And that puts the magnetization down along X. And then we immediately switch on a radio frequency field along X. So the magnetization is along X, and you've applied a radial frequency field along X. And if you make this field strong enough, it actually locks the magnetization. So although spin 1 and spin 2 may have different offsets, different chemical shifts, if this spin locking field is strong enough, they just sit there aligned along X, and they don't process away. And under those circumstances, and the field needs to be quite strong, you've effectively suppressed the offset. So instead of spin 1 and spin 2 processing at different frequencies, they just sit there and don't process at all. And under those circumstances, this cross-relaxation process does give a net effect, because when you transfer from one spin to another, everything is always in the same direction. So under these circumstances, you can detect the effects of transverse cross-relaxation because the precession is suppressed. And you would then write down the Solomon equations with this term, this sigma xy i2x term, that's the transfer via cross-relaxation from spin 2 to spin 1. And likewise over here, uh, the transfer from spin 1 to spin 2. And if you work out the details theory, this cross-relaxation rate constant depends on J0 and J omega 0. And one of the things that's very important about this is it's always positive. So the transverse cross-relaxation rate constant is always positive. But you'll remember that the one for longitudinal relaxation is positive for small molecules and negative for for large molecules and is zero for medium-sized molecules. So one thing that you can use this experiment for is if you have a molecule where the, where the longitudinal transverse relaxation is almost zero and therefore difficult to detect, you can move to this one. And this is the so-called ROSI experiment, which is analogous to NOSI except instead of having the magnetization on Z during the mixing time, the magnetization is spin-locked during the mixing time. So there it goes, 90T1, spin-locking to get the transverse cross-relaxation and then acquire. And in this, it turns out the cross peaks are always negative, assuming the diagonal peaks are positive, and that's regardless of the correlation time. Um, and it's very useful for medium-sized molecules where the normal NOE is close to zero. And it's actually also useful for distinguishing chemical exchange from uh, cross-relaxation. Because it turns out that in this, chemical exchange peaks are always uh, positive, whereas the NOE peaks are always negative. So you can distinguish between the two um, if you want to. So that's transverse cross-relaxation, which you can only detect if you use this spin-locking experiment. Now I wanted to finish up just by saying a few things about chemical shift anisotropy, and in particular about how this is related to the very important Trozy experiment. So as you know, if you put a molecule in a magnetic field, the magnetic field experienced by the nucleus is modified 
by the electronic environment that that nucleus finds itself in. And in fact, normally, this electronic environment is not uh, symmetrical. In other words, if you do a thought experiment of rotating the molecule in the magnetic field, you'll find that the chemical shift varies as a function of the orientation of the molecule. And what that means is the local field is varying as a function of orientation, and that's therefore an origin of a fluctuating uh, local field and hence relaxation. So this is called chemical shift anisotropy, CSA, and that's uh, the origin of, of relaxation. Now the simplest case you can have for chemical shift anisotropy is called an axially symmetric shielding tensor, and that has uh, one chemical shift in one direction and a different chemical shift if you're perpendicular to that, and they're called sigma parallel and sigma perpendicular, the two components. And this kind of chemical shift tensor you'd commonly see to a good approximation in a simple CH group or a simple NH group. Um, so for example, the nitrogen chemical shift anisotropy is to a good approximation axially symmetric and pointing along the NH bond, uh, for example, in an amide. And you can go through the detailed theory about what the transverse and longitudinal relaxation rate constants would be. Uh, and you would find, not surprisingly, that the longitudinal relaxation rate, rate constant Rz depends on J at omega naught. And that the transverse one has a secular term that depends on J at zero and a non-secular term that depends on J at omega naught. And this constant C depends on the magnetic field strength and this chemical shift difference. Uh, so you can see that the rate constants go as the square of the magnetic field strength. So chemical shift anisotropy relaxation increases very rapidly with magnetic field. And this difference between the two uh, shielding constants is often called the anisotropy. And again, you can see uh, that that increases the, the, the larger this anisotropy, the faster relaxation. This has a rather curious property that in the fast motion limit, these two rate constants are not equal, but they're in the ratio of 7 to 6, which no doubt reveals something about the symmetry of space-time, but I don't know. So that's CSA relaxation. Now, if you think about an NH pair, for example, uh, the nitrogen probably has two sources of relaxation. It will have relaxation due to its chemical shift anisotropy, which we've already just described, and it will also be relaxed by dipolar interaction with the proton that's attached to it. And if you've got different sources of relaxation, the simplest assumption you could make would be that they would add up. In other words, to get the total relaxation rate, you would add up the contribution from the CSA relaxation and the contribution from the dipolar relaxation. But this will only be true if the fluctuations which are causing one kind of relaxation and the fluctuations which are causing the other kind of relaxation are completely independent of one another. That is that they are not correlated. If there is some correlation between uh, these two random fields, then you can get some subtle interference effects occurring, uh, and these are particularly pronounced in the case of uh, CSA and dipolar relaxation. If you think about an NH group in a molecule, of course they're correlated, these motions. They can't help but be, because when the molecule goes round like this, it's changing the orientation of the CSA tensor, it's also changing the orientation of the NH vector, and it's the same motion causing the two things. So they must be correlated. So this isn't a very weird, unusual effect. This is actually the norm, that there's a correlation between these two different quantities. So we have to worry about these interference effects. Now, again, the theory of this is pretty hairy. Uh, so I'll just describe what you get. 
So let's think of these two spins as being coupled, the N15 and the proton. And so we've got spin 1 here, and that will be a doublet. And there will be two lines in this doublet, one of which will be associated with the other spin being up, and one of which will be associated with the other spin being down. That's how we, we interpret this. Now this spin experiences a, a fluctuating field due to the motion and due to its chemical shift anisotropy. And it also experiences a fluctuating field because of this dipolar interaction with the other spin. So these are the two random fields that you're experiencing. And if these two nuclei are bonded together, then there must be quite a strong correlation between these fluctuations. Now, think about this spin here. This spin is creating a field here, and the direction of the field it's creating depends on whether this spin is being up or down. So the, lo the, the local field produced by this dipolar interaction depends on whether this spin is in the alpha or the beta spin state. And for example, if it so turned out that when this spin was up, the dipolar field and the CSA field added up, if I turn this field over, then the dipolar field and the CSA field would cancel. Right? So you would basically expect if there's an interference effect uh, that has a certain result for one spin orientation, when you, turn the other, when you turn this spin over, you'll get a different result. And what that means is that the two lines of the doublet will relax at different rates because the two random fields combine in different ways. So the take-home message is the way these local fields interact or combine at one spin depends on the spin state of the second spin. And that means the transverse relaxation rate will be different for the two lines of the doublet, and that means the two lines will have different widths. And this is a sort of effect that you can see. Uh, in the case of A, I've assumed that the dipolar field and the CSA field are not correlated at all, and then you get two lines of equal width. In B, I've assumed that they are correlated, and in one of the lines, the CSA field has enhanced by the dipolar field, and that's made the line get even broader. But in the other line, the CSA field is so the dipolar field detracts from the CSA field and the relaxation is less effective and then the line gets a lot narrower. And this process of um, interference between relaxation effects is called cross-correlation. So A is without cross-correlation and B is with cross-correlation. Uh, what you mustn't do, by the way, is decouple. Because the moment you decouple, you randomize the spin state of this spin, and then you just end up with the average between the broad line and the narrow line, which is just kind of a medium line, which isn't very interesting. So if you want to get this effect, you have to keep the spin states clear so you can see the sharp line and the broad line. And this is the Trozzi effect. Uh, if you take um, an NH fragment, <coughs> at around a field of 25 Tesla, and you're in the slow motion limit, in other words, if you're working with a protein, the CSA and dipolar fields actually almost cancel one another exactly. So you can get a very, very narrow line for one of them and a very broad line for the other. And there's a whole cottage industry based around developing techniques which utilizes this very sharp line. So you can have a very large protein tumbling rather slowly, which you would normally expect to give very broad lines. But because of this interference effect, magically, one of the lines is very narrow. And that uh, is a very, very nice thing. It also goes to show you that there must be some good in the world that someone arranged for an NH fragment to have exactly this effect at exactly the magnetic field that we can create.
So this is called the Trozzi effect. Uh, you can see that you get a huge improvement in signal-to-noise ratio because you get all that intensity in a sharp line. Um, and that means you can look at much larger proteins than you normally would. But you must avoid decoupling because that averages the spin states and then you just end up with a medium line, which isn't very interesting. You see the same effect in a CH fragment, not quite to the same extent. Uh, it's most pronounced in NH, but it's certainly of use in the CH case. So that's the Trozzi effect as a result of um, relaxation interference. And it's quite interesting is that this relaxation interference, this cross-correlation, was known in the NMR literature way back from the, from the 70s. You know, people who worked all of this out. And it just sat there as some bizarre curiosity, you know, that the two lines weren't the same. So what? Who cares? And then it suddenly turns out to be unbelievably important uh, in this case here. And that brings us to the end of this section. Thank you.